Lisa's death was both tragic and mysterious because she'd lost control of a car in broad daylight on a quiet country road. But all reports seem to suggest that she was fit and well at the time of the crash. All right. I just I gotta tell you that I had a real frightening dream last night. I dreamed that I woke up and I looked at the sun and it was like a fourth of the size. So it seems like authorities have uncovered new evidence that adds a new twist to the death of R&B icon Lisa Left Eye Lopez over two decades after her death. Lisa's death in 2002 shocked the entire world, not only because it was so tragic, but also because of all the parts of the story that just didn't add up, making it eerily similar to Aliyah's death. In fact, during the investigation into the cause of her death, names like Diddy and Clive Davis kept popping up. There are even rumors that Lisa knew something was about to go down around the time she passed away, so she decided to spend her last moments on Earth reconnecting with nature in Honduras. However, new information reaching us is that Lisa's death might not be in an accident at all. But what did investigators find out that led them to this conclusion? And did Lisa really know something before she left that we didn't? Let's break it down. They react off of instinct. That means if you get nervous, they get nervous. You start doing all of this, then all of a sudden they start they getting start defensive and then that's when they want to sting you. Lisa Left Eye Lopez was one of the R&B icons of the early 1990s and she was the L in the girl group TLC along with Tion T. Boz Watkins and Rosonda Chili Thomas. TLC's first album, Ooh, On the TLC Tip, was released in 1992 and it was an immediate success, selling 6 million copies worldwide. This also made TLC to become a household name in the R&B scene. In 1994, TLC released their second studio album, Crazy Sexy Cool, and it was even more successful than their first album, selling 77,500 copies in the first week. By 2017, the album had reportedly sold 7.7 .7 million copies, making it the best-selling album by a female group in the U.S. All four singles from that album, including Creep, Red Light Special, Waterfalls, and Diggin' on You, charted in the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. TLC was on fire, to say the least. They were also strong advocates of Safe S, and Lisa incorporated this into her style by wearing latex on the right lens of her glasses. Lisa's career was blooming, but her personal life was troubling. First, she had anger issues that stemmed from her alcohol dependence. Lisa's father was an alcoholic, and they had a very dysfunctional relationship where he encouraged Lisa to start consuming alcohol from a very young age. My father come over and check on me every weekend. We'd have the case of beer, you know, and hey, we'd get down. And that was one of the ways I got a lot of attention. So that was my thing, you know? I would drink, and my father would say, look at her go, look at her go. I mean, by 15, she was already hooked on booze, and she would later have to do several stints at rehab facilities for alcohol dependence. The thing about Lisa's father is that he usually got violent when he was intoxicated, so he kind of passed that down to Lisa. So because of that, her romantic relationships were usually filled with high highs and low lows. In the early 1990s, Lisa was dating Atlanta Falcons football player Andre Rison, and their relationship was very chaotic. They used to have lots of fights that would sometimes get physical. She even filed a charge against him in September 1993 over the same issue. Then, one day in June 1994, Lisa and Andre had a really huge fight, which also got physical at some point, leaving bruises on her face. In anger, Lisa took some of Andre's new tennis shoes and lit them on fire in the bathtub. She probably wasn't really thinking about the consequences of her actions at the time because she was so angry, or she didn't think the fire would be a big deal. But before she knew it, the fire had escalated and the entire house was on fire. Lisa got arrested and charged with first-degree arson and was sentenced to five years of probation and a $10,000 fine. Because that was not the first time Lisa was setting a fire on purpose. In an earlier incident, she had caught Andre in bed with another woman, so she took all the teddy bears he had bought for her and set them on fire in the bathtub. That's even why the house went up in flames the second time, because Andre had replaced the damaged marble tub with a cheaper fiberglass tub. But even after all this drama, Lisa and Andre remained together for the next seven years. In fact, they were actually engaged at 
at some point, but they broke it off in 2001. Shortly after that, Lisa passed away. Part of the things that made Lisa and Andre's relationship so toxic was that there was kind of a love triangle situation there, where Lisa was allegedly attracted to both Andre and Tupac. Now, Lisa and Tupac's friendship is one of the most inspirational things to come out of the music industry because they really held each other down. However, sources closest to them said Lisa was secretly in love with Tupac, even though their friendship remained platonic while Lisa was alive. Lisa and Tupac met at an industry event in 1991 and became friends immediately. What's crazy is that Tupac and Andre had actually also met at a separate event, and they were friends before Andre and Lisa started dating. At the same time, Lisa's feelings for Tupac grew, and he was present for many of her career milestones, like when TLC was nominated for four awards during the 1996 Grammys. Lisa's friendship with Tupac actually used to cause fights between her and Andre, especially after Tupac supported her when she set the house on fire. But according to her sister, Rain, Tupac had told Lisa when they first met that they could never take things to the bedroom. But then her cousin, Tangy Foreman, said, Lisa adored Tupac. If Tupac wanted to go there, she would have dated Tupac. However, Lisa passed away before any of this could have a chance to come true. For over two decades, there have been many speculations about Lisa's death because when we started getting all the facts, there were some things that didn't add up. For context, Lisa passed away on April 25, 2002, while on vacation in Honduras. She was just 30 years old. Lisa had gone to Honduras on March 30, 2002 to get away from her busy life as a celebrity and reconnect with nature. She was planning to do a 30-day stay at a retreat in Usha village in the town of La Ceiba, Honduras. The retreat was owned by a man named Dr. Sebi, a self-proclaimed herbalist healer who claimed he could cure all diseases through herbs. It is the easiest thing to cure. People see that AIDS is difficult. To me, everything is easy. And to you, it should be too. He also claimed HIV was not the cause of AIDS. Dr. CB didn't have any medical training, so many of his claims were considered pseudoscientific by the medical community. Yet, he had high-profile clients like Michael Jackson, John Travolta, and of course, Lisa Left Eye Lopez. At some point, Dr. Sebi was arrested for practicing medicine without a license and later faced a civil lawsuit that prohibited him from making therapeutic claims for his supplements. But in 2016, Dr. Sebi was arrested again for money laundering and placed in jail. While he was there, he contracted pneumonia and died. There have always been rumors that Dr. Sebi was right in many of his claims, but that he was taken out because he was a threat to Big Pharma. But as for Lisa, none of the controversies surrounding Dr. Sebi at the time could keep her away from his retreat. She enjoyed being at this retreat, and according to her brother, she had even spent up to six months there at a stretch in the past, detoxing and placing herself on a strict diet of herbs and supplements. This time, though, she came with her brother Ronald, her sister Rain, and members of the girl group Egypt, whom she was mentoring. She planned to film a documentary while she was there. Unfortunately, the videos she shot during this period would end up capturing the last days of her life. However, Lisa wasn't just in Honduras to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. She also wanted to set up two educational centers for Honduran children, one of which was built on an 80-acre plot of land she called Camp YAC. The other one was called Creative Castle. A fun fact about Lisa is that in the last few years of her life, she really grew to love teaching and mentoring other young artists and young children. In fact, the whole point of her setting up Left Eye Productions was to discover new talent and help guide them into the industry. At the time, she already had several girl bands under her wing, including Egypt and Black. In 2008, her family later opened Uni Studios to help realize Lisa's dream of helping new artists record music at a low cost in a high-end studio. On the day of the accident, April 25, 2002, Lisa and her crew were in a rented car with Lisa driving when she swerved to avoid a truck that had suddenly stopped in front of her and then to the right to avoid an oncoming car. Remember how Lisa was filming a documentary at the time? Well, that's why we have footage of the crash that shows us what Lisa was doing in the last moments of her life.
However, what you don't see in the footage is that the crash was so bad that the car rolled several times after hitting two trees before coming to rest in a ditch. What you also don't see is that in the process, Lisa and the rest of the people in the car were forcefully ejected from the car through their windows and that Lisa was actually found under the car. When the autopsy results came in, it was discovered that Lisa had died almost instantly from a fracture of the base of the cranium and open cerebral trauma. However, the autopsy also revealed that Lisa was not under the influence. She was fit and aware of her surroundings and there was nothing in her system that could have made her sloppy or slow to respond to emergencies. So this raised a lot of questions because there were so many things that didn't add up about the crash scene. Because on top of Lisa being sober and fit, you also have to remember that at the time, Lisa was driving in broad daylight on some quiet country road. So it was highly unlikely that she had been speeding or that there was so much traffic that she didn't notice oncoming vehicles. Investigators also discovered that there wasn't anything wrong with the car mechanically. So the brakes were intact, the accelerator was good, and the mirrors were complete. They just couldn't find anything physically at the crash site that could explain why the accident happened. And this is where Lisa's entanglement with Tupac comes in because one of the running theories about her death is that her relationship with Tupac is allegedly one of the reasons why she had problems with Diddy, who fancied Lisa. As y'all know, Diddy and TLC, which obviously included Lisa, had a long-standing beef with Diddy and Clive Davis, which even escalated to the point of threats at some point. To give you a little context, TLC was signed to Layface Records in 1991, which was a collaboration between Babyface, L.A. Reid, and Clive Davis's Arista Records. So Clive's Arista Records handled much of TLC's promotion, releases, and business aspects. Now, at the time when TLC was getting signed to Layface Records in 1991, they were all still pretty young and didn't really know how to examine their contract and get themselves a good deal. So the contract they signed only benefited the record label to the extent that the girls had to file for bankruptcy at some point. After they released their first two albums, TLC expected to make a chunk of change because they did really well on the market, even winning them two Grammys in 1996 for Best R&B Album and Best R&B Song. However, despite all that, the girls revealed during the press conference that their pockets were drier than the Sahara. They had hoped to get a better deal from LaFace since they were so commercially successful, and now that the girls were older and wiser, they knew the label was ripping them off big time. However, the big guns didn't even want to listen to them or discuss the contract. So at some point, they decided to take matters into their own hands. Did TLC hold Arista hostage? The record company. The record company, Clive Davis, we held them hostage like guns, the whole shebang. Yeah, yeah it was like that. Because, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I want to make sure you, we sir. understand. Yes. Guns, yes, guns with bullets. With bullets. Come on, give me the story, I'm going to tell baby. you because TLC had generated on Crazy Sexy Cool $75 million and they gave us $50,000 a piece. I was like, what the hell? So, of course, Lisa was the ringleader. Like, we need to go get our money. I need to know where my MF and money's at. So, <laughs> you know, she was, she was locked up in the diversion center for burning down the house. And um, she was just like, Okay, we gonna get LaFace and them girls I was locked up with. We gonna drive up there. We gonna take the gun. And then we had this limo driver. Wait, she just got out of jail. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And we had the limo driver. And um, he was the getaway car. So we went up there and held everybody hostage. And Puffy was the one that snitched us out. Yo, B. Yo, your girls up here mad bugging, yo. And I was like, oh, Puff, why you gonna snitch us out, dog? But he Puff called it. Yeah, because we kicked him out of the meeting. Well, wait a minute. Puff, According to Chili, Lisa was the ringleader of this whole operation, and Clive didn't like it at all. The running theory is that after Diddy snitched on the girls, Clive must have told him how upset and embarrassed he was about the whole ordeal. And Diddy, in turn, added it to his list of grievances against Lisa. You know, Lisa, at this point, had gotten much smarter than she was when she and her bandmates were taken advantage of, so Clive must have seen that as a problem because you can't take advantage of people who know what they're doing. Lisa even took things further by leaving TLC and going solo, during which she would release her album, Supernova. Then, in 2002, she broke ties with Arista and signed with Suge Knight's Death Row Records. Obviously, there was a lot of tension between Lisa, Clive Davis, and Diddy, so it's just a theory, but it makes sense that certain people in executive positions wanted Lisa out because she was becoming a problem to them. Apart from her troubles with Clive Davis and Diddy, Lisa also had other things going on that 
investigators believe might have contributed to her death. So about two weeks before she passed away, Lisa was in a minibus driven by her personal assistant, Stephanie Patterson, when they crashed into a 10-year-old boy named Baron Fuentes Lopez. Allegedly, Lisa and her crew stopped to take the boy to the hospital, and Lisa cradled the boy's bleeding head in her arms the whole time. Unfortunately, he didn't make it. Lisa's lawyer later revealed that neither Lisa's team nor the boy's parents reported the incident to the police. However, Lisa reportedly paid about $3,700 for his medical expenses and funeral costs and gave the family about $1,000 for other expenses. But none of these could help her deal with the guilt, and she even claimed she could feel a spirit following her. It's like she knew something was coming for her because a child had died in an accident involving her, and she and the child had the same last name. She even believed the spirit that she felt was following her might have mistakenly taken the child's life instead of hers. There have also been rumors that Lisa was actually not in the right frame of mind during her last days and that she had gone to this retreat for rehab, not just to relax. As a result, she couldn't react on time during the accident, which caused her to crash. However, forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Hunter revealed that from all indications, Lisa was in the right frame of mind in the weeks leading up to her demise. Looking at the video footage of her last weeks at the retreat in Honduras, Lisa looks relaxed and generally appears to be fit and well. And from reports, she's clearly someone who is in control. She's mentoring a young group of aspiring singers, making a documentary, and looking after her siblings. G also claimed that the fact that Lisa was consuming all these herbs and roots could have impacted her health negatively, but not enough to make her literally lose control of the car she was driving. So I don't believe the purging would have had any influence on her crash. Clearly, Lisa felt she was benefiting from her many visits, but I need to find out what made Lisa put herself through such an extreme ordeal in the first place. However, an important piece of evidence investigators uncovered was that from the video of Lisa's last moments in the car, it's obvious she was not using a seatbelt. Now, the crash itself might have been very suspicious, but autopsy results revealed that it was the aftermath of the crash that really affected Lisa. So, regardless of any other thing that might have been going on with Lisa or whoever had it out for her, she might have been saved if she wore a seatbelt at the time of the incident. Then there are the rumors that suggest that Lisa was actually unalived as a Hollywood sacrifice because of how similar her death was to Aliyah's death. They were both in their primes, young and extremely talented. Also, Aliyah's death had the same mysterious circumstances surrounding it, and she even allegedly never wanted to get on the plane, which eventually caused her death. However, eyewitness reports say someone force-fed her a sleeping pill, and after she was knocked out, they carried her onto the plane without her consent. I'm assuming that the ribbon that you have is in, in, is in memory of Aaliyah. Yeah, um, this is my tool, you know, we put, you know, the style she gave everybody their things in. Um, this is, this, I don't even know what to say. Uh, I just know that that was a murder. You know what I'm saying? That was a spiritual murder, whether people know it or not. Because God don't kill people. You know what I'm saying? Whether people know it or not. And, um, I could go deep, but a lot of people I would have to really bring proof. You know what I'm saying? For what I learned. And she just was cut down in the prime of her life. And it's so unfair, and um, it wasn't time. You know, it wasn't. I, I believe it wasn't her time to go because, from what I know, it ain't supposed to go down like that. And um, just simple obedience, like, you know, your gut always warns you. This that your gut never lies to you. And something like luggage, and clothes, and jewelry, and all this madness that we worship is called false idols. We need to really look at the bigger picture right now. Yeah. And look at how exactly. honey to be here right now. Yeah. The lesson. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Mary J. Blig even once called Aaliyah's death a spiritual murder. Plus, there have been rumors that, like Lisa, Aaliyah also had a feeling something was coming for her, which is why she didn't want to get on that plane in the first place. But of course, we may never know the truth about what really happened to these two talented and beautiful women. However, fans still believe there's something shady about Lisa's death, like this fan who commented, Hers and Aaliyah's death will never sit right with men. Not to be a conspiracy theorist, but I genuinely believe there's way more to the story of their deaths gone too soon. Another fan said, I still believe Left Eye was taken out. The look in her eyes in her last moments said it all. She was so beautiful and talented, gone too soon. But what do y'all think about the circumstances surrounding Lisa's death? Do you think it was all natural or do you think she was set up in some way? Comment down below and we'll see you in the next video.